open up your or open up your sodas right now before the we start with the main part of the show. But uh, thank you for being here. Um, you know, I there are many people in this room, and the three of us have been working on this thing we've called comprehensive immigration reform or immigration reform for uh, eight years now. It's hard to believe. Um, and I, you know, my oldest son was five, uh, I guess, when I started uh, working on this. Uh, and I just want to, we wanted to get together two of the people that I speak to the most, that I respect the most, whose opinions, who, when I try to figure out what's going on with immigration reform, Frank and Tamar are the two people that I, I call. And so I wanted to make sure that you got a chance and to hear from them um, to give us a sense of where we are. And I think that one of the, and I'm not going to go through long introductions other than to say that, you know, Frank and Frank Sherry and Tamar Jacoby have been, you know, quoted, have written articles, have been on the front page of the Huffington Post, have written scholarly pieces in foreign affairs. I mean, in every possible way, the two of them have been intellectual and political thought leaders on the issue of immigration reform uh, for eight years. And, and I think what's important about that is that they've not just been advocates, they have rolled up their sleeves, you know, worked and worked really hard to build, to keep the coalitions together that could actually make this possible. They've been constructive actors from sort of different places in this debate, and that's why I think this is a really in interesting uh, discussion we're going to have today. Um, I think what we were just talking, and I think the other reason we wanted to be here today at this particular time is that I think while we may not agree on everything we're going to say today, and I am going to try to be more of a moderator than a combatant today in the discussion, which is a little hard for me, but I'm going to do my best, is that we're all very optimistic that something really meaningful can get done in the next few months. And I think the pessimism that you hear in this town around this issue is unfounded uh, and not warranted, uh, because it's our basic position, and you'll hear in a minute, that we're closer to a deal today than we've been at any point during this debate in the last eight years. Uh, and that's from people on the inside of this. Maybe we're Pollyannish, right? Maybe we don't want to see all this work go to waste, right? I don't think so. I don't think that's what's going on here. I think we are actually, from the vote, those of us who have been on the inside of every moment of this debate for the last eight years, we're really close. And it's why I think we're really optimistic. There are some hurdles, no doubt, but we're going to be talking both about what makes us optimistic and the hurdles ahead for the rest of this discussion. So thank you for being here today. And kicking this off is uh, my good friend, you know, one of the things that also you know, you know, unites all three of us is we have history in Connecticut. <laughs> That's something we got to talk about. Uh, turns out that Tamar and I figured out that at one point in her life, when I was in high school, right, Tamar's family rented uh, a house in Wilton, Connecticut, about a half a mile from my house, and we actually lived a half a mile away from each other for a couple summers um, in Wilton, Connecticut, one of the most beautiful places in the world. So it's one of the other reasons that she and I are such close friends and work together so well. But Tamar, welcome. Give us your thoughts, and then we'll hear from Frank. We'll open it up to all your questions. Thanks, everybody. Simon, thank you so much. I mean, it's conventional to say thank you for a kind introduction, but that was really a, 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 a kind introduction, more than kind. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here with both of my good old friends. I mean, how long have we been doing this? My goodness. Um, sparring with each other, collaborating with each other, uh, trying to get this uh, over the finish line. I mean, I guess maybe it should be said if it's not obvious, he's a D, I'm an R. And, uh, <laughs> and Simon's a D, but, you know, a, dif a, a different kind of D. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, so this is really, really a pleasure, a labor of love, um, as, as much as anything else. And um, I do agree with Simon that the conventional wisdom out there, which is that this is dead, forget it, you know, Syria got in the way, the debt, got in the debt ceiling got in the way, politics got in the way, you know, partisanship got in the way, I think is uh, undue alarmism. And I'm not saying it's, you know, I know it's going to happen on, you know, X date, but I think... Um, I think, I think it's important as we kind of look at the moment. The moment is an uncertain moment. But I think what's important to look at is um, how serious is the kind of slowing that we're seeing? Um, how much does it go to the fundamentals and how much is it about 
uh, things that are not related to the fundamentals. So what I want to start doing, start by doing, is just looking a little bit at that. I want to try to separate the figure from the ground, or what I call the fundamentals from the context and the climate. So you know the fundamentals. And that's really like what really, you know, in, and especially in my party, in the Republican Party, you know, where are we on this? You know, are the Republicans in the House prepared to do immigration reform or not? And I think the fundamentals are better than they have ever been in my 10 years here trying to do this. And the way I look at this, I say, you know, uh, we have proponents of reform in very powerful places in the House, Repu in the Republican Party in the House. Leadership, Can Mr. Cantor, Speaker Boehner, uh, Mr. Goodlatte, and Paul Ryan all you know, are very invested in reform, not just saying, okay, we'll let reform happen, maybe, you know, hold our nose and make it happen. They want it to happen. You know, in the last 10 years, most of the Republican conference has been against reform. <laughs> and now we have these powerful players at the top of the party really invested in getting it done. And it's just important to step back and realize that. Number two, our opponents, the opponents of reform, uh, who once really were kind of synonymous with the Republican conference, right? Mr. Remember Mr. Tancredo, you know, blast from the past? And um, once upon a time, Mr. Sensenbrenner, I think this changes mine now, but, and you know, most recently Mr. King spoke for the party uh, in the House. Well, they don't speak for the party anymore. You know, Mr. King is a marginalized, isolated figure, criticized by leadership, and you know, kind of doesn't smell that good to anyone. That's huge, you know, and that's w in the last year. Um, and then the majority in the middle, and these are the majority, so you have, you know, the, the King faction on one side, um, dwindling, still there, but dwindling. The pro faction on the other side, also small, but growing. Most people are in the middle, right? Most Republican members of the, of the House are grappling with this issue. But, you know, I remember as, as recently as July, and that's, I think, the moment we have to go back to, when most Republicans in the House understood it had to get done, and we're grappling with what could they be for. And when we say it, it's not the Senate bill, it's that we had to attack, we had to grapple with immigration, and the question was what can I be for, and what can I be for specifically for the 11 million unauthorized immigrants in the country. And you know, as I made my rounds in July, I didn't meet a Republican member who wasn't really wrestling with it and saying, you know, how far can I go? And what can I vote for? And I know I have to do something, what can I get to? And I mean, I just meeting after meeting after meeting. And that, I believe, I don't think that's changed. Um, I think, you know, August, everyone, uh, you know, the battle for August, who won the battle for August? I think the people who were in favor of reform, you know, certainly held our own, if not won. And no one in the party has, like, decided against doing this. It's not like we've come back and people said, oh, I changed my mind, I was for it in July, now I don't want to do it anymore. What's happened, and here I go back, the climate and the context has changed, right? And, you know, we can get bogged down in kind of figuring out exactly what's going on up there. You know, I don't think it's exactly about Syria. It's not exactly about that we ran out of floor time, because we never were going to have that much floor time. What I think it's about is there's only, people can only have so many hard things on their plate at any given moment. Um, and there can o that leadership can only be asking the conference to do hard thi so many hard things at any given moment. And leadership can only be asking the conference to do so many hard things that the president wants that the, that the conference isn't sure it wants at any given moment. It's all about those things, you know, the president, leadership, the rest of the Republican conference. It's not about immigration. So, you know, the good thing is, you know, and I don't know exactly when that will clear, um, and I think, you know, we'll see in the next couple of weeks. But the way I think about immigration is it is still a plane basically on the runway, potentially ready to take off. Um, you know, it's a little bit when there are all these other bigger issues, uh, war in the Middle East, the debt ceiling, um, you know, possible default by the country, it falls down the list. I mean, there's no question of the list of important things to do, but I still think there's a lingering sense that it has to get done and that the party has to get to it. So it's a little bit for me now, it's a little bit like, you know, when you have to go to the dentist, but you don't have to go this week. So you say, well, you know, I'll do it next week. Um, I think that's kind of where immigration is. I don't think people have decided not to do it. It's just saying it's a little easy to, you know, they can put it off now because they got all these other burning things. But it's still there, still potentially ripe to go. And I think, you know, what has to, ha and, and we're seeing, I mean, somebody like committee, the, the chairman of the committee, Mr. Goodlatte, said last week, you know, we're going to continue moving bills through the committee. And that's, I think, the what's the, you know, our best sort of hope is that members who know that it has to get done keep asserting that and leadership hears them. Because I think if leadership has a sense that there's
there's an appetite in the conference, then leadership will not feel like they're sort of shoving it down people's throats and they'll be more eager to move ahead. So I think you know, the key to sort of the next few weeks is, is members who want to get it done making that clear to leadership. And then I think there's a, a chance that it can really come back and, and, they'll, and the momentum will rekindle. But what I want to do in the, in, the, in the minutes I have left is I want to put, put politics aside for a minute and talk about substance, right? Because I think like the big question is, you know, kind of where, not just are the, our house ours ready to do it, but where are our house ours and what do they want? And, you know, I think a couple things are really clear, don't need to be belabored. You know, we're not talking about the Senate bill. House ours are not going to take up the Senate bill, no chance. House ours are not going to take up a comprehensive package, you know, no chance, just like put it aside. Um, I do think that the plan is, you know, is, c can is p potentially still is still in place. I think it's still Mr. Goodlatte's plan to do a bunch of pieces that can be strung together in a package that can be sent to conference with a comprehensive bill. I think it's pretty clear that there's going to be a Kids Act, right, a version of the Dream Act, and I think that you know all the other pieces are going to be taken care of: low skilled, high skilled, ag, whatever. The big mystery, right, is what our House Republicans are going to be able to do about adult unauthorized, the people who are not going to get helped by the DREAM Act, but are who are here out of status. And, you know, basically I think the answer is pretty clear on that, actually. I mean, I think there's a been an idea, and I'd like to spend some minutes talking about it, because I, I think it's clear what it is, and I think it's, you know, actually a pretty good, you know, pretty good, an okay answer. And I think I'd, I'd like to explain a little bit what it is a little more. It's worth examining. So it's an idea, it's not just Mr. Goodlatte's idea or Mr. Ryan's idea, although they've recently articulated it. It's been floating around in among Republican circles for, you know, nine months now, a year, gaining traction, and Mr. Goodlatte and Mr. Ryan have recently articulated it. So what is it exactly? Um, well, before I get to it, let me just step back a minute. You know, I understand there's a moral case for what's in the Senate bill, right? There's a moral case for path to citizenship for everyone. You know, it's a core American ideal. We're all, all men are created equal, equality before the law. You know, we don't want a situation where we have some people who um, have full rights and other people who don't. You know, that's anathema to Americans for a lot of reasons. Um, I understand that moral case. But the point is the House Republicans are not going to pass a path to citizenship like that for everyone. Just like, you know, no way, not woulda, coulda, shoulda, not maybe, not, you know, if the moon comes out a different way. That's just not going to happen in the House. And there's actually a reason for that, and that's because House Republicans have a different moral absolute. Like the, the path to citizenship moral absolute is somebody's moral absolute, but House Republicans have a different moral absolute, and it has to do with the morality of breaking the law. And, you know, so for House Republicans, the nation, the position is, the core moral position is, the nation cannot and must not reward people who have broken the law by giving them something that's unavailable to people who obeyed the law. And, you know, you can like that as a moral absolute, you can disagree with it, you can say the law was stupid, you know, whatever, whatever, we all know the arguments. But for many House Republicans, that's as much of a moral absolute as the no caste moral absolute is for Democrats, right? So we have these two competing moral absolutes. And, you know, in my view, the hard truth is that Congress is not going to get to a deal, uh, we're not going to resolve the situation for the millions of people whose lives hang in the balance, until we come up with an answer that honors both of those moral absolutes. So the Republican, you know, c uh, House Conference thinks it has an idea that, on that does honor both. So what is the idea exactly? It's a path to legal status that makes no mention of citizenship. It doesn't bar citizenship. Nobody's talking about saying the 11 million can't eventually get to citizenship. But this is the key point, and it's a little hard to understand uh, sometimes because the semantics sound tricky. It doesn't create a new or direct or special path for people who are here unauthorized, who broke the law by coming across the border or staying, overstaying their visa. So path to citizenship potentially, but, n but not a special path or a path only for them, because that would be rewarding people who broke the law. But the idea is that, um, that people would, the, a Republican proposal would allow the unauthorized to earn their way to legal status, right? Right to work, right to travel, right to be in the country without fear of deportation. Uh, would, you'd have to jump through the normal hoops that all the proposals for the last decade have asked people to jump through, paying ta back taxes, working, you know, pr security check, et cetera. It would also be a little bit tougher than that. There'd be, you'd have to come forward and, and admit guilt, right? That's important for Republicans because it's about guilt. And you'd um, be on probation. So if you 
did something wrong and violated your conditions over the 10 years that you were waiting, you could lose your status, which is not really, maybe it's in the Senate bill, but not very strong. Um, so that's sort of legal status. But then the point is, once you got through that, you could, again, live here, work, travel, and you could eventually apply for citizenship, no bar on applying, but you'd only could apply through existing channels some visa program that already exists or some pro other program that already exists that people who are here legally can also use. So the idea of a, you know, I sort of imagine it visually, there can't be a path that only has unauthorized people on it. It has to be a path that's got unauthorized people and authorized. That's okay with Republicans. The people, once they get their legal status, you know, after they've waited to the end of the line, um, can walk on a road that other people are walking on, li existing authorized workers are walking on. And the three channels are basically, your employer could sponsor you, you could marry a citizen, or your children could sponsor you. And so the $64,000 question is like, how many could that eventually accommodate, right? We got 11 million people out there, you know, is that, are those existing channels, is that just for a few or is that gonna be some significant number? And the common assumption is it wouldn't be enough because, you know, right now, like there are all these backlogs. There are 4.5 million people waiting in a backlog. You know, what's gonna happen when suddenly we have this big pig in the python of 11 million people, there's gonna be backlogs for decades. Well, the actually the answer is, it's when you do the math, the numbers that could get could get to the goal through existing paths are actually quite surprising. And here's the math really quickly. A million dreamers, let's say the House, um, the House Kids Act gets a million young people to citizenship. That's about half as many as DACA would get, but it's a million people. Let's say they sponsor their parents. Let's pretend half of them have both parents, half of them have one parent. It's another 1.5 million. So we're already up to 2.5 million, and we're just talking about the dreamers and their parents. Well, then it turns out that another 4.4 million unauthorized Im immigrants in America have citizen children. So within 20 years, 4.4 million citizen children can sponsor their parents. So you add it all together, you get to 7 million of the 11. Now, not all will take advantage of it. The rules might be written slightly differently. You know, I can't predict that that's exactly gonna happen, but that's, and you know, that's a pretty big number, seven of 11. It's not a tiny sliver, it's a big number. So the 64, and now I just wanna in my last few minutes come back to politics, the $64,000 question for me, million dollar question, whatever it is, um, you know, if Republicans can put this deal on the table, and that's still an if, but if Republicans can get back to this and put this deal on the table, will Democrats accept it? And you know, I'm really looking forward to your answers. I'm looking forward to Frank's <laughs> answer and Simon's answer and other people in the room's answer. But just to be clear, here's the deal. We're talking about a million dreamers getting a path to citizenship, you know, direct path, like in the Senate bill, we're talking about 10 million adults who aren't criminals and you know, under deportation orders, whatever, getting a pretty quick and sure path to legalization. And then we're talking about as many as seven million of the 11 that could eventually be citizens within 20 years. And you know, my questions are, when I think about it, is how many of the 11 million would take this deal rather than nothing? How many Americans who just, you know, are really think it's time for Congress to solve this issue and sort of look at it kind of, you know, from the suburbs where they live, you know, doesn't this look like a pretty good deal? Shouldn't we get this done and get over it? But, you know, the hard question is, like, how will Democrats who reject this deal explain themselves to Latino voters, right? And, um, you know, do you say, well, we thought it was better to stand on principle and come away empty-handed than compromise? Um, so I see it as a test for both parties. Will Republicans come through? Will they come back to the issue? Will they, will they put this on the table? And then will Democrats take the deal or will they stand on principle and come away with nothing? And you know, I guess the last thing I just wanna say in closing is I do understand the argument in favor of citizenship for everyone. I mean, I used to make that argument myself. I spent, you know, five years of my life more making that argument. In 06 and 07, I argued strongly against compromise. I called a compromise like legal status. I called it un-American in, in the newspaper. Um, but the truth is I've changed my mind. And I've changed my mind because I look back at 06 and 07, which was really six long, painful years ago. Painful for us, but, you know, really painful if you're unauthorized. Um, and I say, wouldn't it have been better if we compromised back then? Wouldn't have been better if we'd gotten to a deal. Um, and you know, wouldn't legal status for people over these five years have been better than nothing and living um, you know, through the last five years? And I've come to think that the answer is yes. No.
Well, Tamara, you've been provocative as always. Very exciting. I want to thank Simon and Tamar. I mean, there's a, these two are such thought leaders and innovators in this arena, and they've been at it for a long time. Simon's really my mentor, coach. And sometimes like a good coach, he gets in my face. <laughs> and Tamar, we often agree and often disagree, but uh, we do it in the spirit of what's going to get this done. So I'll take the challenge of, uh, you know, how do we get from here to the finish line? First, um, let me just say something, for especially for people who are kind of following this debate for the first time this round. There is a remarkable history to this debate that's worth quickly noting, which is that the pro-reform forces have staged a remarkable comeback in just the last few years. I mean, this is a movement that has, was buffeted by 9-11, buffeted by the Great Recession, uh, 2006, 2007, it looked like we were on the verge of some sort of breakthrough and the, the rise of uh, right-wing opposition was so intense, it, it, it uh, stopped reform, the Republican Party lurched to the right. And if you think about it, as I, I remember it well, Angie Kelly's in the audience from Center for American Progress and has been one of the great leaders and colleagues on this. In early 2012, this is what it looked like to people like Angie and I, it looked like laws like Arizona and Alabama's were going to spread and be implemented, that the Supreme Court was going to give a green light, perhaps, to those laws, that Mitt Romney was, could be elected the most, from our point of view, arguably the most anti-immigrant candidate in a generation, and that President Obama was continuing with 400,000 deportations a year. It sure looked like we, that self-deportation, or as the intellectual authors of it and the restrictionist movement call it, attrition through enforcement, was not only the policy of the Republican Party, it was the policy of the country. And it was likely to be sanctioned both by the judicial branch and the executive branch. Um, a remarkable thing happened. Uh, by the end of 2012, the Supreme Court had ruled that Arizona did not, and other states did not have the right to construct their own immigration enforcement regimes, dealing a real serious blow to uh, the effort by restrictionists to block reform at the federal level and pass very harsh measures at the state level in hopes of driving people out of the country. Mitt Romney embraced uh, attrition through enforcement. He called it self-deportation. So it was not only litigated in the Supreme Court, it was litigated in the election. And as a result, uh, we, all, we know the result, we know the consequences were severe. Uh, Latino and uh, Asian and immigrant voters voted overwhelmingly against Romney, immigration being one of the mobilizing and defining issues in that debate. And as a result, the Republican Party uh, suffered a huge blow, not only at the presidential level, but at the Senate level. So, uh, and then President Obama stepped in and provided relief to dreamers. Um, it was really a, a, a turning point for the president in that he had, I think, been listening to the likes of Rahm Emanuel for too long, afraid to step forward and act boldly on behalf of immigrants. But when he did, in fact, it turned out to be not only a strong policy move, but a brilliant political move. And that really helped mobilize Latino voters. Uh, I love Republicans criticizing it, saying, oh, it's such a crass political move. I think the White House was terrified that the move would backfire, not help them. But it did turn out to help them in a way that was surprising to them and very important for our cause. So after the election, suddenly the political space existed for a policy debate. So it's a remarkable, I think, sign of the times is that the immigration reform movement left, right, and center has never been stronger. And I think that sometimes in the conventional wisdom that we're being slow walked to death, that is overlooked. Now, let's just start with a couple of facts why I'm still optimistic that we're gonna get reform done. First of all, we've had legislation pass the Senate by more than a two to one margin. Secondly, um, we've got the votes right now in the House of Representatives to pass a reasonably good bill. If immigration reform of the path to citizenship were to be negotiated and brought to the floor, there would be more than 218 votes for it. But the problem is, is that the speaker is saying he's gonna invoke the Hastert rule and they're throwing the sand in our faces using all manner of process and calendar excuses to slow walk us. But I think ultimately, well, our fundamentals are stronger than the House Republican dysfunction. So I think that in terms of the policy argument, that the imperative for reform, 
that were winning that argument. Recent Gallup poll had support for reform in the 80s, support among Republicans in the 70s. The more people know about the specifics in the proposals, the more support goes up across the board. This is an argument that we have essentially won. Im comprehensive immigration reform is an idea whose time has come for all but a sliver of the American populace. The political argument, uh, there's been some pushback from people on the right saying the Republicans should double down on white voters, but that's really not a serious argument given the demographic transformation that America's undergoing. The Republicans have a chance in this debate to begin to get right with the rising new American electorate, what, what Ron Brownstein calls the coalition of the ascendant, and this is a huge opportunity for them to start moving in that direction, and they would be very foolish to miss the opportunity. The economic argument, I remember when Tamar did a seminal piece on this in Foreign Policy Magazine, it felt like at the, at the time she was shouting in the wind because most of the arguments were against the economic benefits of immigration. I think that has shifted tremendously with arguments across the spectrum for how immigration creates economic growth, levels the playing field, increases wages, reduces the deficit, increases innovation. The moral argument, this was something that, you know, was very hard. Tamar talked about the rule of law argument versus the human beings involved argument and how for Republicans, I have to say, back in 2006, 2007, the rule of law argument was much more powerful than the moral argument about who are these human beings that are being affected. That has changed. The dreamers have made a huge difference in this. People like Jose Antonio Vargas, huge difference. The human face, the human stories behind the so-called 11 million are being known in a way that ha just hasn't been the case in the past. And I think it's transforming Americans' comfort with the fact that the others, in fact, are us's. And I think the dreamers who are talking about their moms being the dads being the original dreamers is going to further transform the debate and the morality under, undergirding this discussion. Tamar pointed out, I think she's right, proponents are strong, opponents are weak. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I talked to before the August recess who predicted that we were going to be buried in August, that the mobilization on the right was going to kill off immigration reform, and we saw just the opposite happen with a tremendous amount of effort. I've never seen the business community so active. The evangelicals are, are incredibly organized and mobilized. The Catholic Church, the high-tech sector, ag, and then, of course, I think you've seen unprecedented unity and mobilization on the part of progressive forces. So let me uh, try to answer Tamar's question. Is there a deal that people on the left could live with that would comport with what she was outlining? I think there is. I think there is. The details, of course, matter hugely. There were other issues. I mean, if Republican price for a immigration reform is something like the SAFE Act, which is a Arizonification plus Sensenbrenner bill on steroids, that's a non-starter. Um, if they think they can just, you know, re renegotiate all the things that were carefully negotiated in the Senate bill, I don't think that's going to happen. But on the issue of the 11 million, here's my challenge to Tamar and her friends on the right. Bring the damn proposal. Let's hear it. Going to legalize 11 million people and give people a shot at citizenship? That's all we're asking for. Give us a shot. Now, of course the details matter. Is it 100,000 people or a couple of million people? Is it a bar to citizenship or no bar to citizenship? Do you make the family uh, reunification system work by waiving the three and 10 year bars, other specifics that the policy wonks know well? Of course it matters hugely. But when I hear Republicans say no special pathway, no bar to citizenship, kids at the front of the line, um, use the normal system, I see a deal. But we can't make the Republicans come up with one. So to me, for those of you who are looking for key moments, it won't be what happens in the debt ceiling debate. It'll be do Republicans come forward with a, with a proposal on what to do with the 11 million that can build a bridge to the Democrats. And sure, Democrats are going to say, great starting point, let's negotiate with the Senate. They're going to want to have a say in it, of course, as our senators who are Republicans are going to want to have a say in it. But if House Republicans come forward with a common sense approach to dealing with the 11 million, I think we'll get across the finish line this year. I'll stop there.
So I, I said at the beginning, hold on, we have to do this for the TV and the internet. Um, I said at the beginning that uh, we were collectively optimistic uh, and um, that, you know, I think if the three of us could sit down and do a deal, then we could probably be done by lunch, by the end of lunch. Uh, I actually really, uh, and I'll get into this in a little bit, so I, I want to ask Tamar and Frank each a question, but I, I think that part of our message is if you really pull apart what has passed out of committee, five bills have passed out of committee in the House, right? Um, they may not have numbers attached to them, and there's some games involved, but you know there was a sentiment in their approach. And for example, the Homeland Security Committee passed a border bill that was much more reasonable and thoughtful than what passed out of the Senate, frankly, uh, in, the, in the final bill. And it was bipartisan and, and unanimous, right, where all the Democrats were supporting the Republicans. If you get honest about where, you know, other, and I think the SAFE Act is one of these areas where there's going to be some tough negotiations. I just don't, my own view, and we'll talk about this more, is that the two chambers and the two bodies are not, and the two parties are not that far apart. Um, and that with strong leadership exerted by the president and the, and the chiefs of both chambers, I, I, you know, I think people could probably work a lot of this out over lunch one day. Um, there really isn't that much, you know, in terms of the substance, there really isn't that much there. There's a lot of politics in all this and a lot of people that have to be consulted. But I, I don't, I, part of my, our challenge to you is, as you make your own decision about where we are, you know, part of our argument is I don't think we're that far apart and we're certainly closer than before. Um, I want to ask, I'm the privilege of the moderator, I want to ask each of you a question if I could and then we'll turn it over to the, to the audience. Is that, um, Tamar, in the, in the discussions about the path to legalization, there have been some members who have said there has to be a trigger involving border security um, and there have been other members who have not raised that. What, what's your sense about what the, the thinking is on that right now? Yeah, I think there's no question there. I, I, I'm surprised that you think there's a faction that doesn't think there needs to be a, 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 an enforcement trigger. I think there will definitely have to be a border security trigger and an E-Verify trigger. And the questions will be, are those reasonable triggers and meetable triggers? Or, you know, that's if I was a Democrat, what I'd be asking is not, are those triggers going to exist? I would say, are they going to be meetable? And you know, the Senate has triggers, the Senate bill has triggers. There's no question, I think, that there's going to be triggers. But the Senate bill doesn't have triggers on the legalization part. Well, it doesn't sort of. No, this legalization. Yeah. Legalization yeah. as opposed yeah. to citizenship. No, yeah, legalization. So the, que the question uh, is, uh, uh, legalization. It? So okay, in the okay. Senate bill, yeah. we have, we, practically, the Senate yeah. bill has, within six months of the signing of the bill, the legalization process would begin, yeah. and a substantial amount of it would be done within two years. Right. So it's very rapid. Yeah. It's universal. Yeah. Um, what do you? Where do you think? I think I don't see. You're right that there's some turmoil around that. There are some people who would like there to be triggers on even the legalization, but I don't think anyone can quite visualize how it would work. Right? Like, how would you say we've passed this bill? People are going to get to legalize, but they're going to have to stay in the shadows for two years. You know, what are we going to do? Not deport them? So, so I think um, I think there's an instinct to have triggers on even the legalization, but I don't think. Anybody, I don't think it's, I don't think it's workable, and I don't think there's anybody who does have a particularly workable answer on it. So, um, so good question, unresolved. Uh, one of those things that there's a lot of wrestling in the conference, I guess. I mean, the, the thing I didn't say, the terms I didn't use um, when I at the podium, which I think is worth showing on the table now, is you know the Senate was a very top-down process. You know, a bunch of guys eight guys and then some helpers, you know, decided what the answer would be and basically sold it to everyone else. And they didn't sell it perfectly, but pretty much everybody got in line behind them and did what they were supposed to do. The House, it's really a bottom-up process <laughs> in a very messy way um, and potentially problematic way, but also in some ways a reassuring way. It's really democracy. Those guys, you go, you meet your typical House R and you kind of shake them, and he's wrestling with this. You can see the, 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 the gear spinning in his head and he's trying to figure out where he is. And I think this is kind of one of those issues where I can't actually predict it because of that messiness. Um, and, and I think it's important to note that you know the Senate <coughs> had gone through a lot of deliberation about this over a period of time. There was expertise in the Senate. There was a consensus in the Senate. I mean, we passed a bill in 2006 with 62 votes in a Republican-held Senate, right? Um, 
in the House, there hadn't been a serious debate about immigration reform since yeah. 2005, when, just for the record, the House Republicans voted to deport 11 million people, not self-deport, mm. to actually deport mm. 11 million. So mm. from that, so, so part of what John Boehner has said publicly, which I think has been very wise, is I want all these outside groups to come in and help mm. educate my members. I have a lot of new members here who haven't really been through a debate about this. Mm. Help us, right? Some remarkable admission by the speaker in some ways about, you could call it the ignorance of his conference on this, or perhaps the need to educate them on the history of it. So, um, so this is, Frank, what do you think of that answer? That's going to be my question to you about, well, about look, the, about I mean, the I ease think of the path. That, that there be some sort of plan, as in the Senate bill, for border security and enforcement, that there be triggers that are realistically achievable, I don't think that's the issue. I think if, if, if triggers are used to delay initial legal status or to thwart eventual citizenship for most, it becomes a big problem. But I think, I don't think that those will ultimately be the, the deal breakers. I mean, I guess, I guess I, tomorrow what, what I worry about, because I don't speak Republican these days. I used to pretend I did. I don't, <laughs> I don't speak it anymore. So I, I don't understand the culture. It's a very foreign culture to me. Um, and this so-called Hastert rule, which I have, I, I choke on the word rule, because it sounds like an excuse to me. But but uh, the, the question, let's just say that for Speaker Boehner to keep his job, he needs to get a certain number of Republicans to support a proposal. I guess, you know, can you speculate, if there's a proposal along the line that you outline, legalization for the 11, legal status for the 11 million, and citizenship option for most, what do you think the vote count might be if, there, if it was brought up for a House vote? Yeah, well, so first let me just say something about the Hash Street Rule, right? Um, the Hatchet Rule, you know, it's easy to be cynical about it and say it's just about one guy keeping his job. It's about the party cohering. You know, once upon a time in the 1950s, leadership could say, here's what we're going to do, boys. You know, and it was boys. And here's what we're going to do, boys. And, you know, if you, um, we're going to propose it and we want you to vote for it. And if you vote for it, you get your committee assignment and you get your chairmanship and you get the bridge in the district, right? And it was really clear and that's how it worked in both parties. It doesn't work that way anymore. The same way it doesn't work that way in corporations, it doesn't work that way in the parties. Like, the parties are bottom up now, much more. And the, the leadership can't just say, oh, we're going over here, come on. They can only go so far, uh, they, can, they try to push the envelopes of where the conference can go, but they can't go outside those envelopes. And the Hashtag Rule is about that. And if you don't have some coherence of that kind, there's no party. So the Hashtag Rule isn't just about Boehner watching his own skin, the Hashtag Rule is about, is this party gonna function for years going forward? And it's important. And so that Hastert rule, you know, in my view, is, is, a, is not a bad thing, and it's a reality. I think that, the, and I think the people who've been articulating the, the proposal, I, it doesn't matter what I think, but I think the people who've been articulating the proposal I, I tried to, you know, uh, channel, uh, think that they can get a majority of the majority for that proposal. They wouldn't be talking about it. And just one, one point on, on timing, and, and this is really spoken to my Democratic friends, is that if Part of the argument we've been making is that Republicans are too scared to touch this because they're worried about a primary. It's possible that this is going to be easier to do in early 2014 than late 2015. And I'm not, and I, and I just want to put that because at that point the ability for somebody to run against you in a primary is significantly limited uh, because of the lateness on it. And so I, I'm not saying that we should encourage this to bleed into 2014, but I also don't know if there's as big a gun to the head in terms of it has to happen in the next six weeks. It happens in a, if Congress starts falling apart, for example, in the next few weeks, which certainly that is a high likelihood given where we're going right now. Um, you know, we could, it could be that this may get easier to do in the early part of an even year than a late part of an odd year. We just don't know. And I, and I just don't think we should assume that we actually, as Frank said, that we understand that on the Democratic side. I, I agree with that. And I've all, you know, long said I'm not going to commit Harry Carey on December 31st um, if it's not done. Um, but I also think, you know, too long of letting the momentum die is not, yeah. is not a good thing. And, you know, so I think what's important has to happen this fall, again, is that, you know, constituents say to members, say to leadership, got to get this done. You know, it's not, the, it's not the roof repair that you can put off for a year. It's if you don't put it off, something bad is going to well, happen. You compared immigration reform to going to the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe roof repair is a better analogy we can use. Okay. Let's open it up for the room. I know there's a lot of folks here who are passionate on this issue one way or the other. And, uh, so please raise your hand. Do we have a mic, Emma? And just for the folks watching on TV. 
Who wants to go first? I don't believe this is a shy crowd. Stand over there. Yes, sir. Please, over here. Please identify yourself if you could. And I'm, Sterling, I'm Sterling Henry, and I, I'm representing a, a group of uh, nuns who are very much passionate about the immigration field. Please don't ask me how a guy six feet two gets to represent <laughs> <laughs> about 500 nuns. <laughs> but what I was saying is just that I, I, I'm just looking at it as a, as a political person. I say, I, I think you, you, you hit the nail on the head. I think there's enough votes on the, on the House side to actually pass some kind of bill. I really think the problem is just not giving the president or the Democratic Party a perceived victory. I think that's a huge component that's deterring this thing from moving forward. Uh, and I just, I, I don't know whether or not you can ever get over that political barrier of being able to give someone a victory that they know in the long run that's not going to help them. So I just was concerned about the, the, your remarks from both of you on that one. I'm shocked, shocked. Mm -hmm. In Washington, politics is going to determine what people do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, fair enough, fair point. Um, but, you know, I think Republicans also have a stake in this getting done. Um, for all the reasons Frank outlined about Latino voters, but also because this is something that needs to get solved for the country. And I think you know, a lot of voters who aren't just Latino voters are saying, you know, come on, you guys, like, we pay you to solve things, you know, solve this. I think that's, I think most Americans, that's sort of how they see this. You know, it's important, but it's not going to affect their livelihoods, their lives. They don't understand how much it's going to affect their livelihood economically, but they see it as something that Congress has been talking about this for 10 years. Why can't they solve this? And I think Republicans, both for Latino voters and because the parties need to grapple with this, need to grapple with it. So we have, a, we have an interest in it, too. It's not just about giving the, the president a victory. I think there are some, sure, in some moments, people say, why should I do this and, and help the president? But I think when people think about it a little harder, they realize it isn't just about the president. It's about themselves as well and our well, party I, as well. I, I agree with you. I, that's why I'm trying to figure out why they Yeah, look, I mean, I think, you know, President Obama wants this so badly, he's trying to stay out of the way. Yeah. A really remarkable thing on a top pro domestic priority for the second term. I don't know how long he's going to stay out of the way, right? I mean, I think that the get out of jail card that the Democrats are extending to the Republicans on immigration reform has an expiration date on it. And that, uh, you know, it's, I mean, watching the Republican dysfunction on display is painful. I'm interested in seeing whether there are forces within the Republican caucus who are saying, look, as a matter of institutional legitimacy, we have to get this done. As a matter of proving that we can do some things that the public wants that are not that controversial in our base, I think that this is a, I mean, this is a plum opportunity for them to get right with a, a, a diversifying uh, electorate and you know, to show that they can modernize after a couple of decades of uh, increasingly racialized politics. But I'm telling you, it's not that, I, I don't think Democrats and progressives, I can speak for, I don't know about Democrats, I can speak for our movement. I mean, I think if there's not m like a commitment and, and movement this fall before the end of the year, I'm not sure there's gonna be a lot of willingness to go into next year for very long and say, gee, let's hope they work it out. I think there's gonna be increasingly a focus on 2014 not that there's an expectation that Democrats are necessarily going to take the House back on this issue. I don't think that's the case, but I think it could contribute to a tsunami or at least a loss of seats. And I do think that uh, many in our movement will conclude that we can't win the kind of immigration reform that we want unless we have Democrats controlling both chambers in the White House. And so people will be looking to 2016 to see if that can be made happen. That may sound harsh, and t but like, come on. We have said you can have the toughest enforcement in American history. You can have new visa programs and new visas. All we ask for is that we deal practically and humanely with the 11 million, and guess what? You get to grow the economy, share credit, show that you can get things done, and have lots of credit for doing so. And it's, well, it's hard. It's going to take some time. I just think that um, patients will wear thin. Of course we want to get it done. We're not going to say, you know, arbitrarily, you know, we're going to just stop pushing for reform. We'll look at all options. But I do think that there's going to be a focus next year increasingly on 
the elections and quite frankly on what uh, uh, President Obama can do with executive authority. And there's not gonna be a lot of waiting around for Republicans to figure it out if they don't take advantage of the opening that exists right now. So the only thing I wanna say to that is, um, and I don't wanna be making excuses for Republicans, but you dismiss the base awfully cavalierly. I mean, um, Republican primaries are very real and every member of the House of Representatives, every Republican in the House of Representatives is terrified of a, being primaried. And who votes in, it doesn't take very many people to swing a primary to a, a, a Tea Party right wing challenger. And, and you know, so we didn't hear a lot in August and those people are in retreat and it's all very nice, but they haven't disappeared and they definitely haven't disappeared from the primary electorate. And so, it's, you know, and, and yeah, you know, you have to be a politician, you have to be a big boy and you have to lead and you have to take some risks and whatever, but people don't, you know, it goes back to Lindsey Graham. Uh, immigration is a, is a jobs issue, jobs for politicians. People don't want to lose <laughs> their job over it. <laughs> yeah, but um, if Club for Growth was gearing up to work on this issue, I'd have more sympathy for the argument. When Spencer Bacchus, who was primaried in 2010 in Alabama by Scott Beeson, the author of HB 56, the anti-immigrant law, and won, and now he's one of the most outspoken proponents of a path to citizenship, I don't know, that to me is the kind of politician I want to see more of. Yeah, but it's different in every district, and people are really afraid of things. So, you know, whatever. Well, and, I, and just to add on that, why we're sort of exploring this political dimension is that you know, the other admonition to the Republicans is what's happened in Arizona, right? I mean, Arizona was just recently, right, the exporter of this kind of crazy politics to the rest of the country, and you had the symbol of Jan Brewer, Joe Arpaio, sort of becoming these national political figures. You know, today, after the Supreme Court decision, uh, and after the Democrats started to wake up to the opportunities in Arizona, a state that Bill Clinton won in 1996, a state that is not a deeply conservative state by any measure, you know, the congressional delegation today in Arizona is five to four Democrat. It's a majority Democratic delegation. The mayors of Tucson and Phoenix are both Democrats for the first time in 40 years. Um, you know, you have McCain has said publicly that one of the reasons he's pushing for immigration reform is if we don't get it done, Arizona is going to become a Democratic state for the rest of his life. Uh, and so you have, and you have Jan Brewer, right? Although she's not softened her tone on immigration, she is one of the few Republican governors who broke with her party and accepted uh, Obamacare's Medicaid provisions. Now, why is that significant, right? Well, if she spent most of her time demonizing Latinos for, be, you know, for being um, you know, people who are on the public trough and everything else, you know, Medicaid in Arizona is gonna be disproportionately benefiting Latino uh, uh, citizens in, in Arizona. And so that was a break from the anti-immigrant politics. It may not have been done over immigration, right? But it was a absolute cultural break to the point where uh, the, the guy who had been Senate Majority Leader, Frank, uh, Russell Pierce, Russell Pierce. was pub her old ally in all this anti-immigrant politics, publicly attacked her for having sold out the anti-immigrant movement over the Medicaid decision, right? Mm -hmm. So Arizona is a different place today than it was just a few years ago, they're coming out the other end of this politics the way that California did, right? And the way the rest of the Southwest did, the way that Texas will uh, eventually. And the story of Arizona is one of those great lessons for the Republican Party that if they don't get right, yeah. they're gonna see another state and the rest of the country slip away. And that's just happened, and that's something that needs a little bit more attention, I think, in the national media. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Russell Berman with The Hill. Um, you talk about how the, the issues that have cropped up, um, you know, Syria and the debt fight and all of that, aren't, it's not about immigration, it's about the timing. But how concerned are you that uh, John Boehner is simply too weak at this point to pull his conference along uh, on immigration? And do you think that it will take him making a decision not to run again in 2014 for this to happen? Or can he basically both uh, do immigration reform and continue to be speaker? So I think, that's a very complicated answer, and I don't know. If I knew, I would like be <laughs> much more you know, important than I am, <laughs> right? A, you know, political crystal ball person. But um, um, 
what I would say is I don't think this is about John Boehner pulling the conference along that simply. I think there's a lot of people in the conference who understand this has to get done. And I think it's about, it's, it's mid-tier. You know, again, it's Mr. Goodlatte, right? And Mr. Goodlatte is a consensual politician. So Mr. Goodlatte isn't a crusader. Mr. Goodlatte is hearing other people and thinking that it needs to get done and I can help midwife it, right? And then there's lots of other people who aren't yet there to exactly what the there is, but know that the party has to tackle it. And you know, that's kind of where I live, is talking to members of that sort of, you know, not the, not the I mean, not that I don't know some of the guys who just got here, but you know, those sort of mid-level people who understand that, yes, it's hard in their district, Yes, especially like if you're from Texas, you know, you're gonna be torn between the Texas of tomorrow and the Texas of today, kind <coughs> of. But know that, it, that for the sake of their futures and for the sake of the country of solving it, it needs to get done. So it's not like it's like Boehner versus the hordes who don't wanna go there. There's a, there's a bottom up groundswell of we need to grapple with this and we need to come out with an answer that's, that's a, you know, a decent answer for the party. And so the, it's, you know, exactly what's gonna happen to Boehner, I can't predict, and I don't wanna predict, I wish him well, but, um, but, but this isn't just about him. This is, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a, thank goodness, you know, it's a deep, it's a, there's more of a movement in the right direction. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Peter Boyce, Community Affairs Consultant. Mr. Sherry, tomorrow has actually informed us that the Republicans will segment, break up this bill one way or another in the House. My question to you, Mr. Sherry, at what point do you think compromise would be enough or too far to draw the line in terms of getting, remember, it's supposed to be a comprehensive immigration reform bill. Tomorrow's compadres in the, <laughs> in the House, obviously, they want to chop up this bill. At what point do you say, Mr. Sherry, enough is enough, this is what the deal should be, or do we just walk away from it and maybe wait for 2014 and 16? Yeah, I think, I think this whole issue of comprehensive versus piecemeal in this current debate is, is I understand the confusion around it. I, I'm less troubled by how they get to a negotiation with the Senate than if they get to a Senate negotiation. So. Kamar described it uh, the way that we would like to see it. If they have an immigration week where they vote on seven, eight bills, and it includes all the pieces that correspond, or most of the pieces that correspond with the Senate bill, and then they, they go into a negotiation, whether it's pre-conference or conference or whatever, with the Senate and say, okay, we're going to try to come up with a package. To me, the reason that Republicans are saying that is because comprehensive equals, in their mind, Obamacare. Bad. Swallowing bad stuff. So I see it as kind of a fiction that's being used to get to a comprehensive bill. Raul Labrador said it well. He said, there's a way to deal with this in a step-by-step -step fashion that results in a comprehensive solution. I'm down with that. I can live with that. However, if they start passing pieces you know, one one week, the next week, and, 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 it's, and it, that to me suggests that they're more interested in pretending they've done something and setting up what in Washington we call the blame game. We tried, they wouldn't help, we did our thing, they did our thing, we all think there needs to be reform, they're bad, we're good, go home. We're not interested in a blame game, we're interested in a result. So how they proceed with their pieces, whether they say let's do it in sequence so that we can negotiate, let's enter in good faith negotiations with the Senate will be much more important to us than whether they do it in pieces. Is that, is that clear up by it? Kamara, you wanna? Yeah, well, I mean, the only thing I would say about that, Frank's answer kind of made me think, you know, on both these issues, comprehensive or piecemeal, and special path to citizenship versus no bar to citizenship, we're a lot closer. It comes back to what you said. I mean, we're arguing about the word special, and we're arguing about, you know, can, can bills get passed separately and then rope together? In, a, in an ideal world. I mean, okay. we're not, we're not, it hasn't happened yet, but I mean that, you know, in my vision of sort of the best possibility, what's separating us is the difference between special and not special, yeah. you know? There's a bilingual, bicultural challenge going on. <laughs> 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 you have to decode some of the language, but the fact that it's in, in code is, is, a lo is concerning because sometimes the code can mean I don't want to come forth and say what I really want. Or you could say it's encouraging because it means they're really close. I'm, I'm encouraged, I just want, at, at some point we need to go from <laughs> 
coded language and sound bites to pieces of paper with words on them. But I think the most important challenge right now, to be clear, is not, I think if we could get back to where we were on July 31st, we'd be in a very good position. I think there, things were, there was a lot of momentum among House R's. There, all these elements were close or on the table. I think the problem is that other things have gotten in the way. So I really go back to figure and ground. And I think the problem is all this other stuff that's, you know, all this, all this fog or whatever it is, you know, that's going on as a result of what's happening in the party and what's happening between, you know, all these other complications. If we could get back to this issue, I would, I think, you know, there's, there's, I'd be hopeful. I think the challenge kind of facing us in the next few weeks, months is making, getting them back to it. So let me, let me um, do now appropriately something I, you know, I wrote a piece in July, which is on our website, which among other things laid out a deal. And so I'm going to do that now because it's sort of the question you just asked, which is, so if I'm negotiating with Tamar, right? Here's <coughs> where Both negotiating. Yeah, with here's me. where we could end up. Um, and I'm not saying this is where we will end up, but it's an exercise about whether a deal is possible. And then you decide whether or not you as a Democrat, those of you in the room, could actually accept it on the other end, right? So what we just go through the five major components, right? The first is on the border. The House has rejected the border surge. It was one of the stupidest moments of this entire you know, debate, frankly. Uh, <coughs> and, and the House Republicans have passed a much more reasonable border bill than what came out of the Senate. Uh, and so we already see that they're willing to do something that was consistent with the original Senate Gang of Eight proposal, which was thoughtful and serious, and as Frank pointed out, the toughest that we've ever seen right, in, in history, after having many years, by the way, of tremendous success by DHS in making the border you know, more safer than it's been in generations. right? Uh, this, so I think there is a deal that can be done there. The second thing is on uh, high-skilled visas we know there, and low-skilled visas. We know there's consensus on the high end. On the low end, my gut is that Democrats are going to have to give more W visas to the Republicans. That's going to be tough on our side, but you know, in, a, in, the, in the scope <laughs> of a deal, right? these things have to be put on the table. The third thing uh, is on interior enforcement. I think, as Frank pointed out, that could be a place that is among the toughest of negotiations. The, Goodlatte has really leaned into the interior enforcement piece. There seems to be a lot of energy inside the Republican side on this. I think we may have to accept maybe one thing that we wouldn't have wanted in that Goodlatte menu of many, many ridiculous things that he actually uh, passed in the, in the SAFE Act. Um, and because the interior enforcement stuff that's already in the Senate bill is already very strong, and, and we're already committed to a very rapid path to E-Verify already, right? I mean, so it's adding much more to that but there may be have to one thing in there, right? Fourth is, and this is something we've done a lot of work on, is on border infrastructure investment. I think this is actually could be end up becoming important. One tenth of all the votes in the House Republican Conference are Texas Republicans. No state benefits more from trade with Mexico than Texas. Uh, it's an economic issue. It's a jobs issue with Texas. Mexico, for those of you who don't know, our trade with Mexico has doubled in the last five years. Mexico is now our third largest trading partner, our second largest export market in the world. Right? We trade. We Mexico buys twice as much from the United States as China does today. It's arguably a more significant trading relationship than even China is. And if we, the infrastructure that's there to facilitate that trade was designed for a trade relationship one third the current size. There's going to have to be significant investment made. And I think you could see. I think that will sweeten the pot for the Republicans in Texas, in particular. And one of my hopes is that you know we do more to bring John. I think that will bring John Cornyn back into this debate. And it's going to be a lot easier for us to pass this House bill, this thing through the House with John Cornyn helping, than being on the other side. And I think strategically, Democrats made a tremendous mistake by pissing off John Cornyn in the Senate process. It may not have mattered in the Senate bill, but it matters in the House bill. And I think this was a tactical, strategic mistake that we made. We need Cornyn on the inside of this thing helping out, or at least not trashing it. Very hard for 25 Republicans in Texas to vote for a bill that both, both of their senators are opposing. And that's just something we've got to work on. I think the border infrastructure piece of this is key, and I think there's a lot of work being done on this in the House. Finally, no special path. We talked about today. Frank already said he thinks that a deal can get struck. My own view is that if it's universal, immediate, without condition, no trigger, Right, I think you could get a deal. I just laid out, and I just laid this out. Right, I think literally reasonable people could sit down over lunch and work all this out from a policy standpoint. It's a question, of, and I think that's enough potentially to get us because they're winning on safe, they're winning on the W visas, they're getting enough 
right, without the Democrats really, I think, giving away the story uh, and, and getting, so the point about that is, I'm not saying that's where we're gonna end up, but I also think that shows how close we really are and I think we can get, a, I think we, we don't need the House, you know, I think we can get over 110, 120 Republicans at the end of the day along something like this. And I want to credit, I just want to especially shout out to two Republicans who I think are trying really hard. I think Goodlatte and McCall are really trying to get this done. And, and I think this, the demonization by the Democrats of the Republican conference has been a little bit um, sloppy. Right? I think there are Republicans in there who are trying really hard to prevent this from happening. I think there are a lot of Republicans who are trying hard to actually get this done in a conference that really is, as Tamar called it, it's like going to the dentist, right, you know, for them. And, and I think they've come a lot further, and I think we have to, Frank pointed out, we've been very generous and, and, and get letting them off the hook. That card gets revoked at some point during this path, but I think that we're a lot closer to getting this thing done, and, and, uh, and I think the continued calls that some my allies have made for them to pass the Senate bill. Every time we say that, it pushes us further away from the deal, right? It's insulting to the House Republicans. It's a rhetoric that should just be dropped by our family. It's never gonna happen. And when does the House ever follow what the Senate does? It never happens. It's not how our system is set up. And so I think that part of the argument I would just argue, you know, say is that I think we're much closer to getting this done, and I think there is a lot of momentum, and let's hope that if we all keep working really hard, right, uh, and that you know we get this thing done by the end of October, right, Frank? That's when I'm meant to your deal. <laughs> I'm meant to your deal. I know. Deal. I'm going to get yelled at for that. It's okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. That's what my uh, is. Char Charlie Erickson with Hispanic Link News Service. Question for uh, Tamar and Frank: uh, We're starting to hear a lot more concern about how uh, the progressives are going to accept the bill than we are the, the uh, Republicans, and I would like to know. Uh, and I think one issue that will weigh on that will be how many people of the 11 million people will actually be eligible or able to gain citizenship. Uh, we hear figures that barely half will. We hear a lot of var varying figures. How many do you think would be eligible and do you think that will have a bearing on how the uh, Congress votes? Yeah, so I laid out some numbers earlier which I think are probably, you know, probably on the high end of what will actually happen, but um, uh, I think it's dangerous. I think it's. I think it's. Um, it's. 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 We're. It's again getting sort of ahead of ourselves with the crystal ball to figure out exactly what those. We're. It's getting ahead of ourselves with. Um, you know, into the weeds that we can't predict to figure out exactly what those numbers are going to be. I think they're going to be higher than many people expect. But you're right. They can't be so high. They can't be. They, there's some limits on how high. Well, I did. I threw out some numbers. I said that I think if you if you just look at there's there's 4.4 million unauthorized immigrants with citizen children. I don't think we're going to change the rules that say citizen children can't sponsor their parents. What about the cost for them? Even if you afford it, it's not expensive. I mean, it's not it's over 20 years. People can save up some money to sponsor their parents. Over 20 years, people can save up the money to sponsor their parents. The parent category is unlimited, so that any any number of children can sponsor their parents. And there are 4.4 million children who will be able to sponsor their parents. Now, I suppose Republicans could rewrite those rules, but those are pretty ingrained rules in the system. I don't see any. Rewrite yeah, Charlie, I, I, I'm uh, more optimistic about how many people will qualify at the beginning and then eventually for citizenship than some of the critics on the left. I think that the critique from the left has to do with the amount of enforcement being accepted in this debate, but they know that, that the, the stronger argument among progressives is to attack the legalization and citizenship proposals. I think the estimates that only half would el be eligible, I don't think those are serious uh, analyses. I think in terms of the 11 million, the main questions are gonna be the criminal bars and the difficulty and costs of implementation and, and application. Um, and I think that if, if, if we do it right, if, look, and, and here's the thing, it's, it's legislation, it's regulation, it's litigation, it's follow-through legislation. This debate on the 11 million doesn't start and end with the bill. It starts with the bill and then it goes through all of those steps, almost of necessity. So we're gonna continue to fight to maximize the number of people who get immediate initial legal status. I think my, my back of the envelope calculations is that because of the criminal bars and implementation challenges, 
we might go from 11 million to 10 million in terms of initial legal status. Citizenship depends on the architecture. Under the Senate bill, I think uh, far more than half would be uh, able to get it eventually. Uh, I know there's concerns about work and income requirements. I think we have lots of time to work those things out in regulation or in subsequent uh, uh, legislation. So I think the people who are uh, uh, painting doomsday scenarios about the 11 million and then how many are citizenship are underselling our ability to take legislation and keep driving it until most of the people get at least legal status and if they want an option at citizenship. Been a lot of guys. We gotta leave it at that. Thanks, Laura Meckler from the Wall Street Journal. Um, to play devil's advocate here, we've heard a lot of optimism about um, how this is all going to happen, and you guys are able to come to an, you know, a difficult agreement among yourselves. But um, you know, if you, for those of us who are also just looking at what the dynamics are in the House, here we have. You know, Republican leadership has not committed to bring anything to the floor. We haven't seen any proposal, much less a piece of legislation, much less a hearing or a date for anything that addresses the 11 million. We haven't even seen legislation for the KIDS Act or a specific commitment of a timeline for any of the above. So, um, you know, looking at it from the outside, I, and, and now we hear you guys saying, well, we could compromise, and they haven't even moved, really, in any specific way. They've floated some ideas, and Mr. Goodla has said publicly that he doesn't think there's anything wrong with a, essentially a debating society where they pass their legislation and then, you know, say, where they're, say what they're for and doesn't have to, why do we think it has to become an actual law? So I'm just wondering what, what, where your optimism comes from <laughs> that they're actually going to move this this fall when there are so many signs that they do not appear to be ready so, to do So I think, um, for one thing, fair enough, right, fair enough. And, um, but I also think that, um, first of all, the, whatever, whatever proposal is put forward on the 11 million is not going to have a long shelf life before it, it gets voted on, right? No one thinks that that proposal for the 11 million should hang out there for a long time. Um, you know, we, we, right now, you know, who's going to write it, whatever, is less, is less and, and, but I think there's, nobody thinks it should, you know, float around for a long time and get for target practice. So I think that, that we'll, you'll see that when the rest of the debate is ripening and moving and going to go, and then you know th that will come forward. So I'm not concerned that we haven't seen that debated at a hearing. That doesn't concern me. Um, and I think you know there's no clear proponent right now who would be introducing it. I think that also you know that th there's a there's quite a consensus building around this notion, and I think you know and and it's it's been very carefully. Um, N people, people who are talking about it aren't the, aren't going to be the kind of people who are going to be talking about it. You know, Mr. Goodlatte doesn't just come up. You know, Mr. Goodlatte is not a crusader. Mr. Goodlatte is a consensus politician, and Mr. Goodlatte is not going to be talking about this unless he thinks there's a fair amount of support. Mr. Goodlatte's not going to bring anything to the committee unless he thinks he's going to pass it. Um, so, you know, sure, there's a lot of um, you know, keep your curb your enthusiasm, keep your expectations in check kind of talk. But I think just because we don't see this materializing yet does not necessarily concern me. I do think that the, you know, the House and the whole political scene is sort of in, in, in a lot of, you know, disarray right now. I, I, dysfunction is a big word. I'm not sure I'd use that. But, um, you know, <laughs> um, w so anything materializing is, 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 is very uncertain. But I don't, I don't, nobody voted down this down. You know, no Republicans, I don't, I didn't talk to any Republicans who were for this in July and were coming to think, what's my answer? Who said, oh, I've changed my mind now. I really don't want to do that. You know, let's be, you know, uh, August scared me. I ran into the Tea Party. You don't hear that. So I think this is about the other um, disarray getting out of the way, and then I think this, you know, remains there on the runway as a potential plane to then take off. Yeah, I would just say, interested in Simon's views as well, but I, 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 look, I understand the skepticism. <laughs> you know, they can't pass a farm bill. Why could they pass a, you know, a bill with a path to citizenship. I, I get that. Um, but I think what we're trying to say, and I, I'll, let me just, for the record, Simon, who I love, I don't agree that John Cornyn and Bob Goodlatte are the horses to ride to reform. <laughs> I just want to say that publicly uh, as one of the people who have gone out of our way to make it clear that we're not so uh, confident <laughs> in their leadership. 
Um, uh, but uh, the point is, is that because the, the sand that's been thrown in all of our faces on process grounds by the House Republicans, it's harder to see that there is a policy architecture that could, in fact, lead to a, a bill. And I think that's the point that uh, we're making here is that we're not that far. It's people hear piecemeal versus comprehensive, they say no deal. They say there's no proposal on the 11 million, there's no deal. They say the Democrats will draw a hard line, there's no deal. And I, and, and, and I think that none of those are as rock solid as people tend to think, and therefore there's more hope for us. Now, as I said in my presentation, let's see the proposal. Here's the thing that I'm looking for, right? I'm looking for the bipartisan moment where House Republicans approach House Democrats and say, this is what we can come up with. We think roughly half of our caucus can be for it. What do you think? Tamar says she doesn't think Democrats will be there at that moment. I suspect they will be there if the proposal's good enough. <coughs> now, will they say we take it locked perfectly just like you said? Of course not. But see, I think it's actually a different dynamic. I think what House Republicans think is that they're going to come up with a proposal that, that a majority of the majority can support and that no Democrats in the House might um, support it, but that it becomes the bottom line for conference. I think, I, think, I think that bipartisan moment would be great, but I'm not sure anyone's counting on it happening. And, and, and I would Give us a chance. Okay, yeah. well, you know, fine, fine. But I'm just- Give I'm us just, a chance. Yeah. So this, is, this, this is where we got to speak, I understand, speak I understand. from our different camps. Yeah, I understand. And I'm, I'm not telling you, that. there is a hunger for a Republican proposal that could be worked with. Yeah. It's not, I mean, if it's, you know, genuine piecemeal, where we'll help a couple hundred thousand people, but then we'll lard on all the enforcement, of course that's not gonna yeah. happen. Yeah. You know, or you have to take the SAFE Act as is or forget it, of course not. But if, 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 if Republicans come up with a proposal that corresponds to their sound bites, those of us who have looked at this from a policy point of view, can see through the coded language to a deal that Democrats could support. That doesn't mean that the details they would come up with would be something Democrats could support. It's that it could be supported if the negotiation is done in good faith. So um, I know you're worried about our team. I'm worried about your team. Let's get our teams yeah. together. But, but, and I just want to say, the one other thing I want to say about what you just said is, um, I take my hope not because we can see an abstract deal, which I think is nice, you know, it's great, we could do it, but I take my main hope from what the ferment I saw in your rank and file Republican members in June and July. And I think right now, those people are sort of, again, they now they think it's like the dentist appointment they could put off. But when they really thought they had to go to the dentist the next day, you know, they'd sort of come up with a, well, I may have to switch metaphors now, but <laughs> they'd, come up with a, they'd come up with an answer they were gonna be able to give the dentist. And right now, you know, they feel like they can put it off. But you know, I, 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 you know, I think there was a, a, a period in July when I saw like a dozen members in the space in a few days. You don't, off, I don't often get to see members, but I happened to see a dozen members in the space in a few days, and they were from all over the spectrum, including very conservative people, and they were getting ready to be for something, and and they were grappling with what it was, and that's where I take my biggest hope that if the that if the chaos can and the and the dust, you know, can sort of settle that that's still there. Um. Yeah, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna bring it to a close with two final points, and, and we'll be hanging around a little bit afterwards, and Frank certainly is easy to see on TV, all media, all media all the time, so if you need to check in with Frank's th <laughs> thinking. <laughs> and by the way, and thank God, thank God that's the case, <laughs> let me just say, I, thank God, and because uh, he's doing a phenomenal job. Um, and for all of us, Frank, thank you for your leadership. Um, so two, 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 final, two final points uh, I want to make. One is that um, on, on this issue of the deal, I think that one of the, the motivating things for me, and, I, and I'm not going to speak for others in this, is that I think it's hard to underestimate the profound impact of immediate rapid legalization. Uh, across the country uh, and, and how important this is for those of us who really understand what's going to happen because it will take an enormous amount of the air out of the, the opposition balloon, right, if you want to call it that. Because if the term that's been the organizing term has been the illegals, and those folks aren't illegal anymore, right, you, and they're actually here legitimately through the process that we have been talking about today, then I think you're going to see an already weakened movement 
we can even further, allowing, for example, the legislative and regulatory things that Frank was describing that have to happen in the second and third phase to become easier because the air has come out of the balloon. And I think there will be a real sense that a real difficult problem has been significantly resolved. I'm not in any way implying that we should settle for a second class. And in fact, I would argue that I may have been one of the first people in Washington making that argument about that it's, it's out of the, the tradition of the United States and certainly the way that we ended the Civil War and all the amendments to the Constitution that came afterwards. I, we fought a civil war over this idea that there is a class of people who are lesser than another class. And I think that it's completely, as Tamar said, inimical to our values to accept that as an end state, right? Having said all that, I think that there is, for Democrats, I think, Tamar, that this idea of immediate, non-triggered legalization that doesn't have ridiculous <coughs> bars around criminal behavior and anything else is a huge carrot uh, and something that I think will cause other things because I think it essentially ends this debate and we will have won. I mean, those of us who are advocates will have prevailed for, I think, for a generation and that, and that we can see a, a, a brighter uh, state. The second, the second final uh, point I want to make is that, um, you know, this has been, I really appreciate Tamar coming here. I appreciate the fact that she's not um, lost uh, faith. It was a second point I was going to make. <laughs> it was, uh, and, and I thought I could bluff my way into my answer, but uh, I, I can't. So I think we're going to mercifully and this, do you guys want last comments, closing thoughts, and what we'll, we'll wrap I just want to say two words, a W visa. Um, you mentioned them, and, nobody, <laughs> and then when nobody took you up on it, <laughs> no. I think if we, you said solve it for a generation. If we want to solve this for the next generation, too, we have to have enough um, way for workers to come legally. We didn't talk about it. We just don't want to Tomorrow, be Tomorrow, by the way, has written it. really eloquently yeah. uh, about the, in, the import of raising the number of W visas in order to prevent future undocumented immigration coming to the country. So if you're interested in that argument on the Immigration Works website, you can find it. Well, Thank you. then I have to say, take, <laughs> take the architecture and fight numbers later. That's what I would say. <laughs> the architecture is, is historic, and I think labor deserves a tremendous amount of credit for getting there. And I think that that is a huge victory and breakthrough, and that the question of numbers is a rather arbitrary one that can be litigated in the future. That would be my recommendation. It's easy to say if you're, well, let's not go here. This is, we, could, we could go on for another couple hours. Um, so Laura, thank you for the we, are, we are optimistic. And I know my second point. My second point is I think you can make a str as compelling an argument that today, and this is all speculative, that both parties may need something to pass and get done before they go home at Christmas because this will have been such a crappy fall for both parties. <laughs> And in some ways, the disarray actually makes it more likely that this passes. Because when you look at the things that are the arrows in the quiver, right, or the things that, that are actually teed up to actually get done, um, you know, this may be more likely than a lot of other things that could get passed. And where you could see both sides shaking hands, getting a bill signed, hugging each other, go home at you know, Christmas time, which is that kind of spirit, than almost anything else. So I, I will make the counter argument that it could be that this disarray is the prerequisite we, ha we need for us to get a bill done uh, in December right before Christmas. What a charitable thing to do, right, right before <laughs> the Christmas holiday to get this done. Thank you to Tamar. Thank, thank you to you Frank. To be continued. Um, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you.